Okay, so uh, Michael is a, a cinematographer and filmmaker uh, working with diverse forms of moving image production. He's also a le lecturer in film production at Concordia. And he is pursuing a doctoral uh, uh, study uh, right now in the humanities interdisciplinary program at Concordia, looking at film technology, cinematography, and aesthetics, uh, basically. And uh, yeah, I'm sure he'll have wonderful things to say as well. Thank you. Thank you, Archie. My sister's performing in that movie, so I'm not going to go very far. Okay. Hello. Good morning. I guess it's still morning. Bon matin. Uh, thanks for coming and uh, listening to us uh, three practitioners, I guess we could say. Uh, and in a sense, I think we've all admitted it's, we're more contributing that than as scholarship analysis of images and image making, but a little more the process of that. Um, so I was invited, it's a bit of a circuitous route uh, that led me here, and in part it's, as Andre said, I'm now pursuing a doctoral degree, so I should actually be presenting a paper like most of you are doing, <laughs> but I haven't written anything. I'm presenting myself. Uh, I hope it's uh, useful uh, that it contributes something to the conference. I'm very interested in uh, technology and the relationship between technology and practice. So I, I am a working cinematographer, we'll say, so I have a long practice of working and collaborating on quite a wide variety of projects, like really everything from small scale, experimental, to a lot of documentary, both long form television, um, artistic projects, uh, uh, multi-screen, media arts, a bit of really a bit of everything, as well as what you might call as uh, productions within the industry, which is an interesting thing, which is something some of you are talking about, and that relationship between industrial practices and creative practices, uh, and some of its problematics. So I'm familiar with all these things, and now I'm kind of in a place where I'm trying to um, come up with some ideas around that, and not just do things, but think about it. I've always thought about it, but now I'm doing it a little more in a context where I'm trying to create some kind of more structured analysis. So to be honest, it's at the very beginning stages, but I, looking, I look at cinematography as the basis of cinema, in a sense, and um, I believe it was Carl Freund, who was the famous director of photography, worked with Murnau and others, who said that the true auteur of cinema is the camera, which is an interesting proposition that it's not, in fact, the director, or even a human, <laughs> but in fact it's the camera itself that produces cinema. Um, I mean, I would argue with him a little on that, because there is a human body interacting with the camera, although we can also see in today's society many cases where there is no human <laughs> connected to a camera. And I'll show you a project I'm working on now, which relates a little bit to that. Um, but here, what I'm doing with this camera at this conference, and this is the one I shot with yesterday, I'll, I'll just show it to you in a second, is that I kind of came to the, the, the conference as someone who could shoot something, but I didn't have a film in mind. I'm very used to the idea that working with equipment could be a process of testing, and that testing is a creative process that leads eventually to something, or not. Many tests are failures. Uh, or if not failures are, give negative results, we could say. 
So, but the negative results inform future work. So I think you'll see what I shot uh, is probably a failure. <laughs> Uh, but because uh, what I wanted to do was test the parameters, kind of the limits of a very specific thing I could do in one hour at the end of the day yesterday while you were all having the cocktail. Um, and I chose to use the, uh, the 16 millimeter um, rather than 35 in part because that was what was mostly left was a lot of 16 stock. And normally these cameras are bolted to a tripod. Right, and as you saw in Kelly's footage uh, and and photos, even even for this camera, so it's it would be bolted on the bottom of the camera to a tripod or fixed to something if you want moving imagery, right? So it could be fixed to a train or a car or something, but it needs to be fixed because it's not meant to be handheld in large part due to the design, this box shaped design, but also due to the fact that it's hand cranked. So to hand crank a camera and hold it and get a shot that's reasonable uh, is difficult. But so I chose to shoot everything handheld. And in part because I wanted to test whether it was possible. So to treat it like a, ca a modern camera, um, something you might do with a camera that didn't have the hand crank. And so the physicality of the hand cranking imposes a specific aesthetic, whether it's wanted or not is another matter. Um, but I've always been interested in the fact that the aesthetics we see on screen are always informed by the technology and the parameters of that technology. And I was very interested in Dave's talk yesterday about optics, which interests me as well, and how you know the, the, the fact that glass has particular characteristics and properties, it affects the aesthetics and therefore the content of the image, which are always related. Um, and so, be, you know, as a cinematographer, I'm consistently thinking and dealing with these kind of issues, and yet often what, what is analyzed is the sort of final result, if there ever is one, but the final result on the screen. Whereas for me, my work is the process. It's always the process, and I'm more interested in the sort of creative dynamic that happens in the productive site. And for me, the productive site is with the camera. Unlike what, it was very interesting what Kelly said, as doing cameraless um, photography, where the, which has a whole history as well. And it doesn't mean it isn't production, though. <laughs> uh, there's, a, there's a creative productive act, but it's cameraless. So for me, there's an interaction between camera, between camera operator, and the operator term is always, I find a little problematic because it kind of connotes, again, industry and working with machines. Uh, but that is the history of cinema. There's always that history. Uh, and so the camera, the operator, as a kind of performance, and that the film itself is a documentation of that performance. So what I've done, like, personally, is a lot of this kind of experimentation that would be considered, you know, experimental. Uh, I don't know what to call it. Even that term is a little odd. Um, but uh, I'll show you this camera for a sec. So you, I mean, you saw Kelly's footage, and this one, this one is also there's no box format. It's much smaller and lighter, and uh, it's uh, fairly easy to manipulate. Sorry for documenting it. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Um, because it's small and light, you know, uh, not coaxial as the film is all on one side, so on two axes as opposed to one. But it's interesting, the, the spools that it uses, the 16 millimeter spools, are the same as today's. And this is from uh, 1924. Yeah, thank you, Jeremy. You got the door fixed, huh? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna break it again. <laughs> yeah, actually, I will leave it open. It doesn't need to be closed. And then, uh, because it's hand cranked, so this is what, I'll just show you what I had to contend with, because I think it's interesting to know that, you know, what you'll see on screen had this problematic, is that, you know, so the viewfinder is there, it's non-reflex, it's basically a tube that looks through the top, like near the lens, but not through the lens, right? Um, so you don't see exactly what the film plane sees, but a close approximation of. It's a 20, 25 millimeter lens, standard angle of view, we'll say, but it's relatively narrow for doing handheld follow footage, which is what I tried to do. So 
that you're cranking here, it does have a nice sound. I'm trying to keep it at the right speed, which I know I didn't, because I didn't practice. And Jeremy recommended singing, which I didn't do, because <laughs> I was trying to concentrate on other things. But it's interesting, the idea of, of song as rhythm, again, as a bodily rhythm, right, that you internalize and then kind of uh, interact with, with the machine uh, in some way. So, and then, but I still wanted to look through the viewfinder. Roy suggested I just don't look through the viewfinder and just shoot. But I used my head as a, as a, as a position to hold the camera as well <laughs> so that I could be like that. <laughs> now, the view, the view through the viewfinder is upside down and backwards because it's not flipped like in a modern camera for viewing purposes. Just like it, it is for the film, of course, it's upside down and backwards. And then you have to crank, but the cranking moves the camera, so as you try to move and follow somebody or alter your shot in some way, or pan or tilt, and I literally was trying to do, you know, walking backwards and we were in the woods and things like that, so it was a little difficult. Roy shot a little bit of footage, but, it w but the reason I mention it is all of these things that are, you know, behind the scenes in a sense become critical to what you see on the screen, which I believe will not be necessarily that successful, but it's worthwhile in the process so that you know what you can and can't do, or you know how that inf might inform the work you want to do. So are you, pre you know, are you coming with uh, preset ideas or are you working through the process and those are your ideas which will end up creating a, uh, some kind of creative work? Thank you, Roy. Um, I was going to show you something else first. But since I started talking about that, I'll quickly go to, so that was, that was me just looking at the camera, and that's exciting. So these are, this is Roy's documentation. And then this is just, just so you see, because it's, it's kind of funny. Uh, I think this will work, yeah. Whoops. footage is much better than No, it doesn't work. Okay. I mean here I did it without looking through the the viewfinder to try that as well. So I have no idea what I'm shooting really. <laughs> okay, that's it. Um yeah, just to give you an idea. So, uh it's tomorrow, yeah, tomorrow evening when you see the footage, you can remember that. So that's, that's in terms of what I'm doing here, I guess, and, and I'm, I'll, I'll just add that I'm interested in, uh, you know, these connections between critical analysis, theory, and practice. So this is what I'm trying to kind of tackle with, so I'm certainly interested in your ideas. You know, I'm really interested in the nature of moving images, you know what 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 is it? What it and what is cinema? And of course, it's been discussed and theorized in many different ways. Um, but for me, it comes directly from the components of cinematography, you know, which are light, uh, camera, optics, space, time, movement. These kind of components, and I'm trying to link them to the thought around those things. So any thoughts you have, I'm interested in. And I'll just, I'll just finish with a project I've been working on <laughs> that's taking forever uh, because I, yeah, I won't explain why. And it involves uh, topographical maps. And um, the backstory is that at Concordia University, like many libraries, they were renovating and decided that all it needed was a lot of space for computers and no more books. Um, and one thing they also got rid of was a huge collection of topographical maps of Canada uh, that they had stored there in these large drawers, you know, which you pull out. Um, and it was quite impressive, the maps going back to the 1950s, uh, produced by, you know, the Natural Resources uh, Canada, which was uh, originally um, mining, um, the Mining and Energy Department of Canada. So the purpose of them, of course, was to 
document the land for exploitation. Um, and topographical maps, so this is the kind of research I'm doing through the image, in a sense. The topographical maps themselves have an interesting history. Uh, originally in Europe were um, a kind of narrative of land, and, but in North America, in the United States and Canada, became images of relief maps of landforms for specifically for uh, exploitation and for territory boundaries. Uh, and in the United States was used a lot also with the Indian Wars, and that was its, that was its kind of a raison d'etre. Um, so the maps are now available all online through Natural, Natural Resources Canada, and it's called, they have a system called uh, Toporama, it's kind of an interesting term, <laughs> like Cinerama, Panorama, this is Toporama, and you can go in and zoom in to anywhere on, on the globe in a sense, and it's quite amazing, and there's, and then you don't have any of this overlap from one map to the next. Uh, you can get a large view, a closer view, and the, all information and data is there. But I find the maps, so I, I, when they were, th they were throwing out all these maps at the library, I went in and decided to collect a whole bunch, mainly because I find them aesthetically really interesting uh, as these kind of, these abstract forms uh, that somehow point to a real object but are really very abstract in their representation. And so the, especially these kinds of maps where there's no cities, no roads, it's just contour lines, water, and emptiness. <laughs> um, so what I started doing was uh, creating my own um, digital archive of them through a creative process. So through where the camera itself and the optics and light would directly inform the, fi the finished image. And so I'm interested in how all of these elements combined change what we see. And so I, uh, I adapted a um, DSLR camera with uh, old kind of thrown out optics, all kinds of things, pieces of glass uh, you can see. And, I, and it's really like a uh, home job taped to the front of the lens port. Here I've got, you know, double lenses. And these are like lenses that are not designed for the sensor of the camera. So they create very close focus, extreme close focus, and very shallow depth of field. So you get very little in focus at all. Um, and then I also used uh, glass elements to control light. So sunlight being the source of illumination for the maps. As, they, as light would be the source of illumination on the earth, they light up the maps. And then what I did is I was interested in the effect of time. So they are all photographs, but uh, over time. So it's time-lapse photography, which are then strung together into sequences. And so I was, I was photographing over as the sun's path would cross across the maps and create these different uh, patterns of light. And part of that comes from the history of lenses, which it's thought that the first lenses that were ever used by humans were may have been used as what they call a burning glass, which was to start fires. So this is the name of the project, in fact, is burning glass. And so they, they kind of end up looking like this, and I'll show you a few images. So this is still in a documentation uh, kind of experimentation stage. And then quickly I'll just show you what it looks, oops, step. Just as a test, there's no sound on this. Actually, sorry, I'll just play it from the beginning because it kind of shows the setup again. rough at this point. And this is a fairly compressed file, sorry about that.
So as I mentioned, you know, the it's it's kind of again the, these components that I'm working with are, you know, light, space, time, and also surface. Right, it's the surface of the map that's important as as a kind of medium itself. You know, and part of the reason why it's not always uh, static, which is what I wanted, is that I'm allowing, you know, the operator to be a part of the project. <laughs> I, could talk, I could talk a little bit about why it's not in film. Um, but, y and you know what, I'm gonna show you, again, I'm, uh, I'm gonna show you a little extract of something else which I'd done earlier, and has some similarities in that, again, it's, um, it's uh, um, single image capture that's then, you know, sort of accelerated in post, you could say, but then again, that's what all films are. They are a certain frame rate, they're all discrete images that are shown at a certain speed, which creates movement. So I did a whole series of these kind of projects um, that were a study of my window, so they're my window projects. <laughs> and with the window, again, being kind of a surface uh, as a canvas, but also uh, is the, both the source of light and also kind of an optical device itself. And it's and is the idea of the camera as chamber, light coming in, the room is the chamber, the light uh, coming through the window. So I did the study of, the of this window. And again, I did it with a, 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 a DSLR, which digital single lens reflex camera. And I chose to do these projects digitally in part because although I have uh, my own sort of history of working with uh, um, celluloid film, which is what I initially learned uh, many years ago and worked with for many, many years, and I was a bit of a film snob back then. Um, but because of the work I do, I was sort of forced into a transition, especially working in documentary productions. It's, it was just a necessary transition that happened. And so I'm very comfortable in the different mediums and I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, a film snob anymore. <laughs> um, and I'm interested in what, it, therefore, what is it that is cinema if it's not film, if the medium of film is not critical to that idea. Uh, and th and so this is these are the components that I'm like I mentioned I'm working with which are the optics the light the surface you know a photo re receptive surface uh, film is one a sensor is another and they have their own qualities and characteristics and you just have to learn how to use them um, so that maybe it's just a quick answer to that so this is another project and I'm just going to show you a bit again without sound but it's just to give you an idea of the kind of things I'm working with as a sort of personal project. Sorry, it does have sound, but I wasn't gonna worry about it. <laughs> and so this is uh, primarily, this is pinhole photography. So here the lens is being removed from the camera and then it goes into uh, pinhole photography.
stop it there. I wasn't planning on doing a, a screening exactly. If there's something else you want to see, we can maybe include it Friday. I have a couple other interesting projects. So the the I'll just m finish by saying that one of the things about this particular film and, and it being pinhole, which if you understand is basically I took a, a lens port and, and drilled a tiny little hole in it, is that optics doesn't imply glass, in fact, that optics is a, is a branch of physics that studies the interaction of light and matter. So a hole, a pinhole, still c it creates an image on the, the, the photoreceptive device. And so what I'm, I'm trying is working with the very specifics of the technology to create imagery that for me says something. Um, and so this is how I feel cinematography can contribute as, as a research discipline, in a sense. And this is what I'm sort of trying to argue in my PhD studies, hopefully convincingly, that, that it could be considered a discipline unto itself and not simply at the service of a larger work or project. So I'll end with that. Thank you. Thank you.